Jeg bor i dag i Berlin. Jeg er journalist, og jeg er freelance journalist og har været det i stort set hele mit liv. Og jeg har efterforsket sagen 9-11, og, og øh, siden jeg gjorde det, siden jeg skrev en bog om 9-11 i 2008, der har jeg sådan set ikke haft ret meget andet at lave, end at kigge på verdenshistorien. Så på et eller andet plan, så har de selv været ude om det, der kommer nu. Øhm, det, det handler om, det er, at ja, det er blevet meget klart, at ude i verden er der et meget stort netværk af meget seriøse journalister, som øh, virkelig er deres opgave værdig, og der er et andet netværk af journalister, som bestemt ikke er det. Og det er det, jeg skal komme ind på. Men jeg tror, jeg vil prøve at kaste mig ud i det. Nu skal vi se, om vi har et signal her fra den her. Ja. Godt. Vi lovede også lige at love mine teknikker på gør sådan her. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's, uh, I'm very happy to be here. And I'd like to share some information with you concerning the, say, the uh, world history. I'm going to take you through a journey. It's not going to be a pleasant one, but it's going to be an interesting one. And when you do so, you can always pick up any point of history and say, it all began at that point. And uh, I'll do so too. Because this is and my analysis. This is uh, a work of an independent journalist, which means you're entitled to not believe me at all. But um, it's based on facts. So here we go. I have decided, and, and I'm also I'm not, no economic expert, so I will no, not go in, into any details. But right after the World War, an agreement was made between the winners to make the US dollar world lead currency, global reserve currency. And um, it sort of made sense at the, at the moment, at the time, because at that time uh, all Europe was destroyed after the war and we, all countries were broke, so we needed some sort of new blood. And it came through this dollar agreement which meant that very quickly the dollar was, you were able to pay with the dollar all over the world. You can buy a taxi in Hong Kong and pay with dollar. So within the first few years, the dollar was around 50% of the global amount of cash inflow. And it all went beautifully with the reconstruction of Europe, with the Marshall uh, aid, the Marshall plan, American products, flooded Europe and was paid with American dollars. It was a beautiful model, actually. And um, as I said, I'm no expert, so I'll have to look at the experts. And uh, according to Bloomberg in 2011, they have described it uh, quite good here. They say that for the first few years, everything was good because American machinery was needed, everything uh, was good, and America had the world's largest uh, gold reserve at the time, so it seemed a, a, a good agreement. But then at the end of the 50s, as the countries began to, to rise, the demand for the dollar went down. And um, it actually went really, it was a, a really a heavy problem, which this letter from uh, 67 uh, proves it's a letter from the uh, German, uh, chairman of the Federal uh, German uh, National Bank, Bundesbank, to the U.S. Federal Reserve, promising, in '67, promising that Germany would never ever trade its dollar into gold. They would never ever demand to get gold for its dollar. And it was called at the time. <clears throat> speculating against the dollar. And that's why Nixon, in 71, came up with this beautiful plan called the Nixon Shop of dropping the gold standard. And what does that mean? It means the basic idea of, of, a, of a note is that you don't have to carry around a, a heavy load of gold. So it, it makes sense. And in 1928, 
the first uh, dollar notes, it was clear that it was a gold certificate. It stood on, on every dollar note, and it was in gold coin payable to the bearer on demand. And that's that's it. That, that's the that's the introduction of this uh, money out of thin air system. In 1934, this text had been altered. No one knows why, but it just did. And suddenly it said. This dollar is redeemable in lawful money at the U.S. Treasury or at any Federal Reserve Bank. Whatever lawful money might have meant. I, I can't figure it out. But then in 63, as you can see, all guarantees, all values have disappeared. They're no, no longer there. Which means that when you stand on a street corner with a dollar in your hand, you have no longer any guarantee that it's anything more worth than the paper it's printed on. But that was the problem all over Europe, that people at that time didn't want the dollar anymore. They, they tried to get rid of it. And the yen was rising, the, the, uh, the uh, D-mark was rising. But anyway, after this 71, two years later, the major part of the uh, European community went along and did the same thing. You should consider, what if they hadn't? What if Angela Merkel or, or uh, the Danish Prime at the time would have said, oh, but you can't leave the gold standard because then we have no control of the amount of money that you are making. If a state leader at the time had said so, <coughs> on the next day, this country would have gone bankrupt. Because, at the time, half of the value in the country was in dollar. So actually they did have very little choice at the time. But they went along, France, Italy, Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg and Denmark, Great Britain, Ireland and Norway. And since then, the governments in these countries have been part of this circus where, say, economics all over the world are still discussing whether money is made out of thin air or not. Uh, and I've read both sides, and I'm no expert, but my common sense tells me it's rather a fact. It is. It seems like it's made, uh, made out of thin air. As if that wasn't enough, then in 73, America introduced this petrodollar system, which is a complete artificial system, meaning that all oil on the globe should forever be traded with dollar. Uh, 74, the US made this agreement with Saudi Arabia, and the year after, all the OPEC members were in. That means that a global resource that we all need, every time it's, it's sold or bought, it stimulates the dollar and no other currency. That leads to this absurd, absurd situation that in Norway you have Norwegian oil from Norwegian ground being drilled by Norwegians and sold for American dollar. Why, why not Norwegian crowns? It would certainly help the Norwegian currency a little bit. What, what happened at the time is a matter of history. It's, 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 uh, I, I don't give you any conspiracy theories at all tonight. Um, it's a matter of, 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 of record that in exchange for this dollar for oil, oil agreement, the US was going to protect the Saudi oil fields against their aggressive neighbors at the time. So, uh, the U.S. started building up the Saudi Secret Service. And they put in military bases all over the country. One of the main persons at the time responsible, he was a director for the CIA uh, in this period, uh, it's George W. Bush, H.W. Uh, Bush, and he was called Puppy among friends. So it, it's not to, to insult him or anything like that. I think the book is insulting enough. Um, 
it's called Family, Family of Secrets, and it's by far proven that the Bush family had huge interests in businesses that are no, not legit, and I can, I, I can actually say that open, I'm going to prove it in, a, in, in, just, in just a while. But what happened at the time was that Toppy, the old Bush, he used this agreement to make covert CIA operations to uh, channel funds to people whom the Congress had already said, that's a no-go, we, we can't go there, exactly as a little bit later with Iran-Contra. Um, and just around this fact, there's been, there's, there are numerous books. What we're talking about with oil is a daily consumption right now from 45 super tankers like this. 45 of these are traveling the globe every day in order to make our cars work. 45 super tankers, that's the amount of oil. <coughs> and the world oil consumption you can see there, it is going, uh, for the oil business it's going the right way. Um, this dollar for oil agreement, who, which was made with Saudi Arabia, this uh, huge country, um, it meant a very large deliverance of military equipment. They got everything from the start, from AVAC, AVAX uh, uh, surveillance uh, and uh, a fleet, they got it all. And they, it, they still do, they get it every day. And all around the country, American military bases were built up uh, by entrepreneurs who were connected to the inner circles of the United States. Uh, and that's a fact, too. That's for record. So what we're talking about here is a man touching some buttons he shouldn't have. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what we're talking about here is we made an agreement with Saudi Arabia, who's ruled by the royal family, who's known for severe violations to human rights, but they have the world's largest oil reserves and the world's largest oil company. So they are definitely the good guys. Uh, a lot of people uh, now have come out and, and made really critical remarks against the Saudis and it's, uh, it's due time, I would say. Um, a couple of, uh, in the Atlantic, uh, a couple of journalists uh, said this, the Saudi ruling elite is operating some like, some, something like a sophisticated criminal enterprise. And that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like a state running a criminal enterprise. Anyway, we're good friends with them, as you can clearly see. We are all good friends with them. All polit politicians in the West are good friends with them. All the politicians that have made what was told from the USA for the last 15 years are good friends with these guys. And they even uh, got the, this, the chairman of the United Nations Human Rights now. I mean, think of it. A country beheading each year more people than ISIS has ever done is now the chief of the UN human rights. Something's wrong. Noam Chomsky has said about <coughs> Saudi Arabia that it's not only directed by an extremist version of Islam, uh, but it's also a missionary state. So it, hu it uses these huge incomes from the oil to make schools and to, to spread out this very, very conservative variant of Islam and an extremist version of this already extreme Islamic uh, uh, thing is then picked up by the ISIS. And that's it. That's why the Saudis support ISIS. Because they don't like, I'll get back to that, but because they don't like the other way of um, living, the is, uh, living as Islamists, 
namely where you can, where women can walk freely on the street, where you don't get your hands cut off if you steal, and sort of more Western-like uh, version. But this dollar for oil agreement between those two countries has secured the demand for the US dollar up till now. It has made an immense wealth to the Saudi di dictatorship and it secures intelligence and strategic cooperation between the two. Military industrial business boom that goes for itself and personal, political and economical power for the people participating. So what did they do? And that's interesting because they just did it again. It's called the Bandit Bank. Um, most people here probably probably ha has forgotten or has never heard about it, but it was founded in '72, closed, f forced closure in '92. It was involved in money laundering, <coughs> bribery, support of terrorism, arms trafficking, kidnapping, murder, and the Iran Contra affair. And some of the people involved in that scandal was Jimmy Carter, Manuel Noriega, Oliver North, Ferdinand Marcos, Saddam Hussein, the Medellin cartel, Kissinger, George W. Bush, H.W. Uh, Bush and James Baker, and many, many more. And what is interesting is that just yesterday, this article in the Irish Times now exposed the Panama it's the first of a, a long row of exposures that are going to come now. But the Panama Papers, this Panama model, has been linked exactly to the same affair, Iran-Contra. The Panama Circus started in 1977. The BCCI started in 1971. They are doing the same thing. They are money laundering, they are trafficking, and it all goes back, this time, once more, to the CIA. Um, what we know about this BCCI, that was in fact run by the CIA and leading US officials, is that it was involved in terrorism all over the world. We do know that it was most likely directly involved in the Iran-Contra affair, the Iraq gate and the rise and the funding of Saddam Hussein, which by the way, who by the way, was funded by the Americans right up till the moment when he invaded Kuwait in 1990. So who delivered his weapons? Um, the rise and the funding of the Afghan Mujahideen, this bank was involved in that too. There are huge amounts of money that need to be transferred and the big news is the crooks do it this way. The crooks with ties and shoes. Let me. But they need more. Um, I call it the ex-president's club because the Carlyle group was founded in the late 80s, uh, 80s in, in the US um, and very, very quickly attracted some of the key players in American politics. They, um, they, um, they hired James Baker, the uh, former Secretary of State. They hired Frank uh, Catalucci, who was uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, John Major, former English Prime. What they do is they hire ex-politicians when they're finished, when they're done. And then they put them on the payroll and give them a huge amount of money to go out in the world and make new deals for the Carlyle Group. And that way, uh, that way, there was, as my colleague John, uh, John uh, Wayne Madsen says, Carlyle uses Bush Senior to make admission in various government offices around the world, from presidents to prime ministers, to kings and sheiks and emirs and whatever it, uh, there is. And then Bush Senior makes money that goes back in his uh, election campaign. And that goes for Obama too. He's not employed, I don't say that, but there are 
they are one, one of the major contributors to uh, Obama's campaign as well, to whatever president is at the top campaign. So, uh, what, why now I have to say, what they did is they bought up the, uh, a large amount of the uh, American war industry, the arms industry, at a time where, the, where it was very cheap to get because uh, everybody was expecting peace on earth. And, uh, well, then, they, the same group of people, the same big group of people, in 77 formed a think tank called uh, Project for a New American Century. Um, within three years, they made this report called, uh, with the name Rebuilding America's Defense. I won't go into the details. But what it's about is how can the United States regain its uh, global position in the next 20, 30 years. And that means how can we boost our war machine? That's what it's all about. And all the technology that we see now with drones and everything is already in there, written between 77 and 2000. And then it says further this process of transformation, meaning this transformation from being almost out in, uh, out in, in, in the desert and then being a world leader, uh, it will bring revolutionary change, but it will be a long one, it says, if we don't get a new Pearl Harbor. Because if we get a new Pearl Harbor, the Americans will rise and back up <coughs> any war initiative that we would ever come to think of, and that's what we want. Um, the report, once again, was uncovered by Sunday, Sunday Herald in 2000, and what they wrote at the time was that this plan for a creation of a global Pax American, that's what, uh, Americana, that was uh, uh, the Sunday Herald uh, writing that, was written, drawn up for Dick Cheney, and this bunch of neocons who had had their fingers into almost everything. everything. Two years later, in October 2001, General Wesley Clark, in, uh, he, he, laid, he said that in uh, 2007, as far as I remember, uh, that he <coughs> knew for a fact, he knows for a fact, that in October 2001, was Pentagon going to take out, and that's the word, take out, we're not talking about invasion, we're taking out seven countries in five years. Naming them Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan and Iran. Um, and then we took Afghanistan uh, up on top of it. Well, look at it. That's the, that's the name of the countries which they were going to take out in five years. Well, mission almost completed. Sudan is pending. But in every other of the countries, the hell is, <coughs> is loose. And um, you can see why. That's the American household. 57% of the American household now goes to military industry. And that was 2000, and that's three years ago. Furthermore, the US sponsors NATO so let's stop talking about NATO being a democratic operation uh, because who pays rules? What is good for the United States is that the arms transfers to the developing nations are skyrocketing now. If you compare these arms costs with other countries, you see that the American uh, empire sticking up there. They, they use as much as the next 12 countries together. And that is the reason why that's, that's dangerous is because that way the whole society is going to be dependent on war. Because it's not only a matter of guns and bullets, it's a matter of a little factory making underwear and getting a deliverance to Pentagon because the troops are going to have new underwear. 
He's not a bad guy, he's no war maker, but he's living off of it, and we're all. Um, I use the word empire. Historians do have a, a, quite a um, simple way of doing it, because they just look at the facts. A, an aircraft carrier just serves one purpose, and one purpose only, and that is to be able to wage war far away from home. And there is no other purpose in having such a thing. And then the historians just count them. Fact is, America has ten, United States, uh, um, England has two, China has one, and Russia has one. That's how historians try to determine which is the empire of our time. Another thing they do, they say, who has the most military support points around the world? And that is the United States. They're all over now. They're all over, more than 900 or something like that, military, military bases all over the world, plus the ones we don't know about. And as you see again, the defense spending, it's outstanding. That's also one of the points that historians check. Who has the largest defense spendings? So, check, check, check. The US is an empire. And furthermore, there are Americans even, even proud of it. One of them is uh, called George Freeman, Friedman. <coughs> and um, he's a very heavy dude in the American society. Uh, he, he founded um, uh, the think tank Stratfor and uh, uh, he's chairman of Geopolit Geopolitical Futures and uh, very deep into it all. He just recently said, or in 2015, he said, the priority of the US is to prevent German capital and technology, technology to be united with Russian natu natural resources and labor to form an invincible combination. They need, they're afraid that Germany is going to be too good friends with Russia. Because if we combine Western technology with Russian minerals and, and resources, we are a superpower. And the US would have to forget all about it. So it's been, as he said, since World War I, this has been a strategic uh, goal of the U.S. Obama said last year, a remarkable uh, interview he, he gave with Vox.com, he said, we occasionally have to twist the arms of countries that wouldn't do what we need them to do. Could you imagine the Danish prime saying and getting away with it, we sometimes have to twist the arms of countries who won't do what we want them to do. It requires a certain state of mind to say so, but he smiled as he said so. Um, the same state of mind makes it possible that they can make a law in the United States allowing the United States military with force to attack the Hague, the International Criminal Court in Hague, in case that a US citizen is held withheld from the court. This sounds totally crazy, doesn't it? I'm sorry, the US has a law allowing them to, with, with power, take out any US citizen being held by the court in Hague. And um, in the remarks of this uh, law, which was signed by, by um, George Bush in August 2002, Senator Jesse Helms referred to this court as the International Kangaroo Court. So our partner doesn't give a shit about the European, the European uh, Court of Justice. And they even have a law about it. I find it remarkable. But when they twist the arms, it looks like that. It can look like that. That was Monrovia, was Syria, twisting the arms in Afghanistan, 
twisting the arms in Somalia. And uh, the old Bush could twist the arms too. He started in 1990 the sanctions against Iraq, which in 1995 uh, had resulted in the death of around a half a million Iraqi children. And at that time, um, Madeleine Albright, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. at the time, was asked, was it worth? Was it worth it? Is, it the, is the price worth it? She looked very gravely, considered for a brief second, then she said, very hard choice, but the price we think, the price is worth it. It wasn't her kids. But it takes a certain mind to say that five, six years of sanctions who have slowly killed half a million children is worth the price. And it's time to speak up about it. The US history of war is a fact. The US has been at war 93% of its lifetime. And that is a fact. And that creates a very unique construction which doesn't occur in any other country before it gets dependent on war. And I'll get back to that. It's a way to, to illustrate that and you have, to, you have to laugh about it sometimes because it's, it's way too crazy, it's way too absurd. But it's going on and on and on. It's so much part of the American culture that even Washington Post talking about uh, we are now entering an era of persistent conflict which is a good thing because then as you can see that was the Vietnam peak good business the Reagan build up good business Clinton reductions then came in 9-11 and the Bush build up very good business and now they're talking about Obama level off but that's because it's 2012 and I guarantee you He's back on level. He's, he's going through the roof, rooftops. Um, so 9-11 was the point where this uh, arms industry, where, where you can see that this industry just <coughs> went uh, way up. And the winners, you can, you can address them. The winners, of course, the arms industry, no doubt about that surveillance industry and it's the, the global key players in, in uh, transports and logistics and then it's uh, entities like the Carlyle Group or like the BCCI Bank or like the Panama uh, uh, crooks. Those are the winners every time no matter what. And then there are other winners well, as you see now, they can't use the BCCI anymore. It's way out in the open. It's closed. Now they can't use the Panama model anymore. Way out in the open, closed. I'm sure they have other means. They don't give up, these guys. And they don't only have one plan. Who also wins in this war of terror are the politicians who then get to be seen with the very leader of the world. I still remember as our uh, prime minister at the time, she needed to make a selfie just to, just to be sure that it was uh, gone over in history. But what these pictures indicate, I'm sorry, he, he really looks a little bit insecure like that. Maybe that's the way he is. What these pictures indicate is that these people are allowed to live an upper first class life where you travel around the world, you go to top meetings, you get top food, you get top everything, you get top paid and you have a job in some sort of any organization when you're done. The, the whole thing is laid out for them if they go along with the show and they do um, the question is as I said there do we trust the winners those are the winners do we trust them because the question is 
is there a deep state in the U.S.? <coughs> and uh, alone on this subject, one could talk for a whole evening, I'll just say most certainly there is. And a lot of authors have uh, been documenting that. And especially since, for the last 15 years, when this deep state has become more and more obvious, more and more difficult for them to hide. A lot of books have come out, laying the whole thing open. All that is needed is someone to read these books, or a free press. Eisenhower, as some of you know, directly warned about uh, a new enemy in his farewell speech in 61, where he said, we have to guard against this unwarranted influence um, while there's a potential for a disastrous rise of misplaced power. And he said, it, will, it exists and it will persist, he said. And then he said, bye-bye. Why did he say so? What did he mean? Three months later, Kennedy talked very similar about the same thing. And he talks about a common danger. He's talking about it's been loomed large on the horizon for many years, and there's no escaping either the gravity or the totality of this challenge to our surveillance, uh, to our survival and to our security. And the official version is that he talked about the Soviets, the Russians. Everyone knowing just a little bit about that time of history knows that at that time no one was afraid to say the Soviets or the Communists or Russia if that was the case. If everything in the United States at that time was about securing the country against these communists. So, I say it's unlikely, but look at this. He goes further on, and this is from the JFK library, so you can check it, anyone can check it out. He's talking about a ruthless conspiracy. He's talking about a system that it works on infiltration instead of invasion. And clearly he is pointing out to the uh, Bay of Pigs 12 days before. Um, and it's re relying on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. Um, could be the Soviets still. Then he says, yeah, then he says, this system has a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Now he can't be talking about the Soviets anymore. He says, its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. He's not talking about the Soviets. Then he finish, finishes off with this sentence, it, this system, it conducts the Cold War. Not they conduct the Cold War if it were the Russians. It, this system, this enemy that he's talking about, is conducting the Cold War. It's out of control. That's what he's saying. <coughs> and a couple of other books saying exactly the same thing. There is a deep state in the United States and it is uh, out of control and it's taking over the democratic processes. All over. Um, so it's time to face the beast. And it will be, I hope it will be unpleasant because it should be. And the press, I must say, in the last 15 years haven't done their job and I'll show you why. But the beast, that's the name of the beast <coughs> in our century. The beast is named the CIA. It's the Central Intelligence Agency of the U.S. It was founded in 47, 49. It was by law made secret regarding numbers of employees and budgets. So, and it's been so ever since. All over 
when it's about covert wars, drug smuggling, arms trading, terror support, and regime changes all over. The CIA was there. So what are they doing nowadays? Well, if you look at their own special review, which they made in 2004, declassified in 2009, so goes five years, uh, but in 2004 they wrote themselves that what they do, they, they write, we run secret prisons all over the world and there we make torture. End of story. Um, and that, this one is from the salt pit in Afghanistan. This drawing is from one of the inmates. He's drawing a waterboard, used for the waterboarding, and a little box in which they kept him during the day. And this report, the CIA report, then came a minor scandal a uh, sort of out, outburst in the press that now someone has to do something. So the Senate Select Committee made a new report in 2012. So now almost 10 years later. Um, but anyway, 6,000 pages saying the CIA does torture. And in details how they did it. And that's it. What we do know is that the CIA has been running secret prisons all over Europe since 2000, since beginning of 2000 and something. Um, Lithuania, in Poland, in yeah, two, two, two of them in Poland, and uh, this one in, in uh, Romania, and surely a lot of other places that we don't know about. They have been flying all over Europe with knowledge of our governments, with people that they had. Kidnapped. That is the word, kidnapping. Um, the map is from Wikileaks and shows some uh, more details uh, of, these, of this network of transportations. Uh, they had, uh, in 2007, 1,200 flights. And I don't know if you can see it, but what they do is they pick someone up at the in, in the street, then they put him in a car or whatever, put him in an airplane, and then they take one of the preferred prisons and dump him there. And a lot of these people in Guantanamo have been all over the world. And into an airplane and into a new box somewhere at the other side of the globe. And no one does anything about it. Um, Senator Dick Marty said uh, in 2005, 100 people have been kidnapped by the CIA in Europe and then rendered to a country where they may use torture. And we do use torture. We did it in Abu Ghraib, and I'll, I'll, I'll spare you, uh, you won't see any very uh, nasty pictures, uh, but they are there, because it was systematically done. Um, Abu Ghraib had seven and a half thousand prisoners, and they were systematically tortured in order to make them confess, com confess to terrorism. In Guantanamo, Camp Delta, exactly the same story, all over, and this drawing is the preferred interrogation method of the CIA in Guantanamo. It's cheap, it's efficient, and you don't need a lot of technology to carry it out bucket of water and a, a little bit of cloth and that's it. But I know what I would do if someone did that to me. I would confess to anything. Anything. I would even do it right now just to be sure I, they won't put water but I don't care. I, I, I give in. And it's way out of line of a democratic society to allow people who are suspected of anything to be treated like that way. The way out. The one, the one person who had admitted having anything to do with 9-11 was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, 
he got waterboarded, according to the record, 183 times. And then he said, I was responsible for 9-11 from A to Z. I understand that. Um, once again, there's been, they spent six years, a lot of millions of dollars, a lot of paperwork <coughs> investigating this hor horrendous torture in Guantanamo, and they came out with the re result once more, the CIA does torture. And the press had a day, a ball with it, for a couple of days, and then we talked about something else. Nothing changes. Guantanamo is still there. Last month, uh, Obama held a speech on Cuba about human rights. I think it's um, quite astonishing. It's not at all the first time, by far, it's not the first time that the CIA has been involved in horrendous business. It started in the early 70s with um, articles claiming that the, there was going some uh, experiments on with uh, hospital patients, with uh, small social communities, and uh, it was postulated that uh, the CIA was giving them drugs. It was more than a postulate. It came out in 73, uh, came out in 74, in 75. The Congress made this huge report in 75, where they exposed a lot of uh, bad work of the CIA. Uh, for instance, the MK Ultra program, where the CIA had had experiments with people who didn't know about it, using. Heroin, morphine, uh, mescaline, psilocybin, stuff I really also don't know about, um, sodium pentothal and LSD. The CIA made lots of experiments with LSD in the early 50s in different community groups and uh, uh, inmates in prisons. That's a fact. Um, in 51, there was uh, an incident in a little French village where all of a sudden four or five hundred people ran around the streets screaming, tearing their clothes off, uh, maintaining, saying they had uh, snakes in their stomachs, going totally bananas, jumping out, out of windows, and no one understood why. At first, once uh, it was said it was uh, um, a mold uh, poisoning from the bread, and it was called the magic bread for some years. Um, what we now know through declassified uh, documents is that this was a CIA experiment. Uh, the first man in the world, uh, there he is, to isolate LSD was this guy. He worked at Santos chemical company in Switzerland, just on the other side of the border of this village. <coughs> those guys from Sanders were the first ones on the scene, and those were the ones saying, this is from the bread, this is mold. What we know is that Sanders was providing, was delivering LSD to the CIA, which they then used for experiments. And what they wanted to see was the effect on LSD if you spread it out, just to see what happened. They did so in 51. I'm sorry to say, it's, a, it's called Project Span. They always had these, they still have these funny, they have this urge to create funny names around their activities. But that's, it. that's all a matter of, of historical record, and the Telegraph wrote about it in, uh, in 2010. So, you can all check it out. This journalist, Gary Webb, uh, wrote about, has been written about the gun trafficking for years and years. Uh, he was the one, actually, to, to start this whole thing. And we know for a fact that Air America, which is a CIA company, is involved 
with gun running, drug smuggling, uh, illegal uh, transportations all over the world again and again and again. And this latest example is from Australia, Daily Telegraph, saying that one of their regional airports has been, is yet involved in guns and drugs, linking to Air America going back to the CIA. In 2007, one of the airplanes that was actually used in these uh, rendition programs where, where, where they where fly around with the prisoners, one of these airplanes, with this tail number, you can check it out, went down in Yucatan with tons of cocaine aboard, on board. It was a CIA plane. Um, this guy, Gary Webb, as I mentioned, he's dead. He died in 2004, and you may not believe this, but he died by multiple gunshots. It was suicide by multiple gunshots. <laughs> According to the official story, which you can read in the coroner's report and in the Los Angeles Times, at some point he, he took a gun, put it to his ear, and the bullet went out through his cheek, so he re uh, directed it and he pulled the trigger once more. And I've checked out, is it possible? Can it really be done? And the answer is, yes, it can. Uh, there's one scientific uh, paper about it, involving only 130 uh, suicides, but actually 3.6% of those were multiple gunshot suicides. So, yes, it's possible. It is, but a lot of my colleagues around the world have their doubts, um, and I don't, I, I don't have any opinion, I just find it uh, remar remarkable. Um, what, what, uh, what is not dangerous is actually to, to list their secret operations, because that's also a matter of history. We now know they were behind the Iranian coup d'etat, they were behind the Bay of Pigs, they were behind the Brazilian coup d'etat, and they were behind the Bologna bombings. And the latter, they were through this Operation Gladio, and just to make it very short, Operation Gladio was the Italian name for the uh, stay-behind forces in Europe after World War II. And they were in every country. In Denmark it was called Operation Absalon. In every country, NATO installed a um, paramilitary force that were uh, connected with each other and were armed and equipped with survival gear and uh, everything in order to have a resistance from day one when the communists would come and invade us. And I mean, it makes sense and that's what, what one does. So this <coughs> work is a fact and it's a historical fact too. But the, sadly, the sad part of it is that part of this network, some of these groups were taken over by the CIA. And that's a matter of historical record too. Um, they were, and I'll show you some. Um, and they did it in order to make destabilization. They have supported right-wing groups, they have su supported left-wing groups, it doesn't matter as long as they're on the wing. Operation Gladio was the secret part of this whole uh, NATO operation and Andreotti, the Italian prime, said in 1990 that this group was involved with the Bologna terror bombing. It was condemned by the European Parliament in 1990 in a huge resolution saying, we don't want any paramilitary CIA forces in Europe. And nothing happened. And it's totally normal. It's very important. KGB does exactly the same thing. Secret services do the same thing for every empire where they work. And the KGB has been supporting Abu Nidal and PFOP and a lot of others throughout history, and the KGB is linked 
to these terror events. That is a fact. I'm sure they won't say it openly, but then take my word for it. The, CIA, the, the KGB works in the same way as the CIA. The, the Secret Service is, is an instrument for the emperor, so to speak, or the other way around, maybe. Um, anyway, Harry Truman, who was, at, who was there when it was created, said CIA was a mistake, which if I'd known what was going to happen, I would never have done it. And this I found on the, as you can see, on the CIA's homepage. So again, it's no conspiracy theory. This is a fact. He said so. And he also probably wrote this piece in 61 where he said, stop, that was right after the Bay of Pigs, stop this military in, uh, development, let the CIA do intelligence and nothing else. It wasn't popular at the time. Well, 15 years later, one of the Watergate journalists, Carl Bernstein, wrote this book where he says that 400 American journalists were on the payroll from the CIA. They got paid to do what they did. Um, two years ago, my colleague in Germany, former editor of the Frankfurter Allgemeine, that's one of the very big ones, he writes in his book, quote, the corruption of journalists and major news outlets by the CIA is routine, accepted, and widespread in the Western media. You really have to let that one sink a little bit. <coughs> if he's right, if I'm right, we are really dealing with some serious problems here. And how, I, how do they do it? They do it through a lot of networks. They have a lot of fancy names. One of the most important in Europe is this one, the Atlantic Bricker. Um, there you have all the senior editors of all the German newspapers, everyone. They meet there with all the senior politicians, with the top industry people, the top finance people of Europe, and I don't know what happens there, I was never there, but one could think it could have some sort of influence on what's being written. Um, don't worry, I won't make this long, but the Atlantic Brigade, it's important for the history, was founded by Eric M. Warburg in 52. He was long lifelong friend with John McClay, who was the first um, administrator of Germany after the, after the war. And on the same day when this was founded, those two guys founded this one, the American Council on Germany, which is a part of the Council on Foreign Relations. And then we are back to the core group of people who have been behind all these major uh, events I've just been talking about, um, Council on Foreign Relations. They are also, Warburg is also um, family related to these two guys, Kuhn and Lu, uh, two Jewish uh, bankers, and they are all related to the Federal Reserve System, which is a totally different story that we can take some other time, but let's say these are the rich guys and they made a society where journalists can meet each other and meet the politicians. Um, <coughs> Oskar Lafontaine is a German <coughs> former Minister of Finance. He also said that some German journalists are told what to write by the CIA should be a well-known fact by now. I mean, if I were to go out in the streets in Denmark and say this, I would probably be laughed at. Uh, and I don't know how it works in Denmark. I can just see that the press works in the same way. Because if there was this unity, you would expect some sort of, oh yeah, okay, right. All talking about the same thing, right? 
I'll show you an example. That's from the day after the G7 summit last summer. Um, all these German newspapers put the picture of Angela Merkel and Obama on top of page one. And these German newspapers did it too, on the same day. And it was not only German, it was international. They all put the same picture on top of page one on the same day. What a coincidence. But not only small newspapers, as you can see the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, El País, we are talking global, major newspapers, all doing the same thing. And it is a nice picture, sure. But can you imagine this picture popping up at the news desks on a given day, and that would result in the senior editors shouting out in the room, here the front page, I've got it! There's no way that it doesn't work that way. So, if it doesn't work that way, how does it work? It works, it's agreed upon. It's agreed upon that we shall all, on this day, know about this G7 summit. It's got nothing to do with journalism. And that way, we talk about Greece, we talk about Strauss Kahn, anyone remember him? Uh, we talk about Ebola, it's totally, tomorrow we talk about something else, and right now we're talking a lot about Putin. Um, it's about making a threat. This makes people worry. And now we've we're talking about Putin again. Um, the story with these Panama Papers is that more than a year ago, a whistleblower from this Panama law firm contacted Süddeutsche and uh, apparently with a huge uh, data load. And Süddeutsche contacted this international consortium of investigative journalists. Sounds great and agreed with them that they would take over the investigation. And it's been done by around 400 journalists from all over the world. And it all sounds great. Um, I will, I'm not here to judge, but I'll just point out that they are a part of Center of Public Integrity, which is supported by the Found Foundation, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Kellogg, and the Open Society Institute with his source. Um, and that would give me reason to worry a bit whether they are really independent or really investigative or something else. Uh, it's the biggest data leak in history. Um, as I said, it concerns files from 1997 till up till now. Um, and out of these 11.5 million documents, they have now selected 149. And those are the ones that we get to see. The rest is going to come out in due time through independent journalists doing their work, writing for small papers like the Irish Times, the, the example I just gave you, where they have exposed the connections between the Panama Papers and the Iran-Contra scandal, it will come out. But what we are talking about is these nine people, those are the bad guys. First and foremost, he really he looks bad. You can see it. And he's a friend of Putin's. Can't be any worse. Uh, a friend of Assad. Yeah, right. We don't like Assad. Sorry. Sorry once more. What's wrong here? Yeah. Poroshenko, maybe he stepped on somebody's toes, I, I don't know. Uh, the president of Iceland, he definitely stepped on somebody's toes um, regarding this uh, banker scandal where Iceland is the only country 
putting the crooks in jail for what they did. Um, president of Argentine, yeah, maybe, a friend of, and the father of Cameron, <coughs> and a king of Saudi Arabia. That's, that's funny. Something's going on here, I think. And then, just for a showcase, a football player and a, a bus from U, UEFA. And there we have the people that we are going to talk about for the next weeks. That made Süddeutsche and The Guardian, which were the two firsts, conclude that this is all Putin's. Putin's associates. Uh, how is Putin linked? Uh, it all, it's all about Putin. And he's not even named in the papers. What's also quite remarkable is that apparently it's from 45 countries all over the world. And I've seen a, a world map with, uh, with the sinners, but there's not a single person in America. Well, um, I'll just leave it there. All talking about the same thing, it leads the thoughts back to a time that I would really not like to live through. Uh, and they're all talking about it in the same way. Um, I just had one little question here. Yeah, now I made a mistake. Uh, is it time that we took a short break, or do we carry on? <coughs> we are around half. Okay, uh, take five minutes break. Yeah. <coughs> okay. <coughs> what we need to know and need to remember is that we know for a fact that around 90% of the people that have been, have been killed in drone strikes are innocent. The rest are not proven guilty. Um, in this case, around 150 people died in Somalia. And it was uh, in March, meaning three weeks ago. Um, again, if you look at the Council on Foreign Relations homepage, you'll find a definition of this drone killing. Uh, they call it targeted killing. Targeted killing. And you'll find this remarkable sentence in an article written by deputy editor Jonathan Masters from the Council on Foreign Relations, meaning this is the official U.S. And they, he writes, targeted killing is not the term distinctly defined under international law, but it gained currency in 2000 after Israel made public a policy of targeting alleged terrorists in the Palestinian territories. So what he's writing here is actually, it's okay, because Israel started killing people who don't go to court. Killing people is okay, it has gained currency because Israel started so. And of course, killing is not a term defined by international uh, warfare laws. It is not defined, the word killing. Killing is a crime. But now it has gained currency and no one talks about it. In Pakistan alone, in this period of 11 years, um, some of the real independent journalists uh, in The Intercept have been analyzing this and found that they had 52 targets, 2,565 people were killed, meaning 2,513 were innocent and 52 were accused of being terrorists. That is murder. In the first degree, I would say. The whole drone killing in the whole continent is run from Germany. From the Rammstein military base in Germany, that's where it's all coordinated. Signals goes under the sea from over here, but it's all only possible because we allow the Americans to operate out of this Rammstein airbase. 
Um, and we do so even though what is done there is killing. It is, by international law, it is killing. We are killing people now, without any cause whatsoever. This is the worst picture I'm going to show you, um, and just an example how it, how it works. 2013, a US drone hit a wedding in Yemen. Uh, it, the Associated Press twittered about it, and it was, uh, yeah, it, 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 nothing would, was done about it. And um, then it was uh, admitted some months later, and about a year later, uh, the survivors got um, compensation from the Yemeni state. <coughs> and that's it. People are still dead. So, since the invasion of Iraq, we have been, we have had military activities throughout the whole region, and that led to the situation in September last year, where almost four million refugees, mostly from Syria, was spread in the neighboring countries. But remarkable, no one in Saudi Arabia, or Kuwait, or Bahrain, or Qatar. But here they are, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq. And again, those seven countries in five years, they all produce refugees. Now, every day. Um, if you look, where do they come from? This map is from the uh, Swiss Institute of, uh, for Peace and Energy Res uh, Research. And the yellow, red ones, uh, the yellow ones are the ones with, um, where the refugees come from. And if you lay over the NATO operations, it actually matches. So I don't know which came first, but at least we know in the countries where NATO has had operations, there are refugees coming out. But then in September last year, everything <coughs> changed. Um, I live in Germany and I can tell you we have received a lot of refugees there. It was twittered all over the globe, refugees welcome. Germany is heaven, go to Germany, come to Europe, but go to Germany. Um, and the Russian Academy, uh, Academy of Science has developed a tool how to analyze these Twitters. And I have no way that I can judge whether this is true or not, exactly as I wouldn't be able to judge anything from the American Academy of Science. But this, as long as this is not disputed, it stands. And what this says is that, first, that first of all, Germany was the major country in all tweets. Germany mentioned in the tweets containing refugees, it was huge, a huge difference. Secondly, if you then analyzed and said how many tweets have both the word refugees welcome and Germany in the same line, then you <coughs> saw this. So the refugees were led to Germany, Austria, England, and then almost not visible. Um, when you then Look at where did these tweets come from. It's very clear <coughs> that most of the tweets luring the refugees to Germany came from England. And the second largest part was the United States. So are we to believe that someone is sitting uh, in California and just tweeting out uh, go to Germany to be a good citizen? 
or something like that. No, that's not the, that's not the point. What was actually taking place was an army of netbots or botnets. And um, a netbot or botnet is a, an army of virtual computers who then again can run a little army of virtual computers who then again and so on. And that's the technique that they use with these so-called DDoS attacks. That's exactly what they do. They create an army <coughs> of bots. And they did so too with these tweets. So what we know is that on 17th of August, 40, that's just examples, 40 automatic netbots coming from the United States simultaneously said a new welcome, activists launch home placement service for refugees in Germany and Austria. And two days later another tweet, two days later another tweet, uh, German soccer fans welcome refugees amid ongoing crisis. Sounds great, doesn't it? That way they created tens of thousands of tweets running around the globe. And a lot of good people retweeted because sound sounded good. It was with pictures of uh, footballs, uh, football games in Germany and uh, great posters with refugees welcome sounded great. So of course it was retweeted and retweeted and retweeted and those retweets are not even in this investigation. They're ex excluded from it. So that way all those millions of refugees that we just saw had been piling up uh, for a couple of years, all of a sudden this wave was released. And that way we had in Germany at least 1.1 million refugees uh, last year. And it's every day, it's going bananas. Um, if you wonder whether migration could be uh, a weapon, you don't have to wonder uh, it is, and it's nothing new. There's been scientific studies about it, how it works, war and migration, what happens. There's been recently some very interesting new books about the phenomenon uh, with the perspective of, of the Middle East. Um, and yes, the Pentagon has sort of created a new world map, and it is based on some of these people from, from these uh, dark places. And you may know that uh, Brzezinski, who's one of them, uh, has a known strategy of wanting Russia to be breaking up in three parts, securing that this country will never ever rise again. Um, so they use migration as a weapon. When they say we want to take out the country, they want to destabilize it. That's it. We've reached a point where I think it, this is almost true. Um, war is peace. Yes, it is. This guy got the Nobel Prize in 2009, and according to their own Council on Foreign Relations uh, information, they dropped a total of 23,000 bombs last year. Nobel Peace Prize. Saudi Arabia, as I said, the beheading state is now head of the world human rights organization. <coughs> Am I missing something here or is everything really upside down now? War is peace. Um, freedom is slavery. I won't get in further into that, but uh, you, can, you should look it up for yourself. It is a total, a ban we are abandoning every single law and rule that we have had in our culture for decades and we are leaving this, all these decisions to a three-man secret court with secret decisions and secret uh, procedures. We are losing it, sorry to say, freedom is slavery. Um, and <laughs> ignorance, you need to be ignorant to buy that one. I mean,
But that's the former chief of the CIA, NSA, he said uh, a couple of weeks ago, he said, the personal freedom in Europe is too high to fight terrorism. So we need something more of, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever we need. So let's look at this terror. That is a question of which came first. That is a question. Because, as this is also a matter of historical records, uh, Brzezinski gave a <coughs> remarkable interview in 1998. It's uh, to be found on the U University of Arizona's website and many others. And um, in this interview he said about Afghanistan and the Taliban, he said, according to the official version of history, CIA <coughs> aid to Mujahideen began during the 1980s. But the reality, secretly guarded until now, is completely otherwise. It was on July 3rd, 1979, and on that day, Brzezinski actually wrote a note to the president saying, if we do so, then the Russians will invade. It was not the other way around. So in this case, at least, we know CIA went in and then began the trouble. Um, why did they do that? Uh, this is a, from, from an official website um, uh, defending the official story of everything, so this is absolutely no conspiracy. They did it because they feared the spread of the Soviet. The Afghan uh, regime was Soviet friendly and not USA friendly. Uh, and they didn't want that, so that's why they, they had to move into Afghanistan at that time. And the goal was to dry, drain the USSR dry, because they would run out of money because of the war. Um, and they did it by providing assistance to uh, different, uh, through the Pakistani Secret Service, and that's important, it's named ISI, and don't get confused, <coughs> uh, it is ISI uh, without an S. Um, and uh, they used billions and billions and they trained Mujahideen forces, they took Mujahideen forces to the US, trained them, equipped them, shipped them back and uh, sent them to war. Um, and <coughs> one of the favorite Mujahideen groups was uh, uh, led by a guy who was close friend to Osama bin Laden um, and Osama bin Laden as we know from News One, for instance, throughout the 80s he was armed by the CIA and funded by the Saudis to wage jihad against the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. So he was CIA, ladies and gentlemen. It's not a conspiracy theory, he was CIA. Um, and as the Independent wrote in 93, the Saudi businessman who recruited Mujahideen. Uh, Al-Qaeda means the base. And what was done, uh, Osama bin Laden recruited uh, around 30,000 warriors and their names were all tipped into a database at the Pakistani intelligence service in Pakistan. And this database was nicknamed the base. Take a look at the base. What have we in the base? And the base, the Arab word, is Al-Qaeda. So, Al-Qaeda means the base. Um, it says here, uh, some analysts, uh, analysts believe that Osama bin Laden had security training from the CIA. And uh, that's a very polite version, because he had. That's a matter, again, of the records. Um, I have to remind the world that in 2009, um, Hillary Clinton said in a CBS interview, I've got it directly from their own transcript here, she said, it seemed like a great idea back in the 80s to embolden and train and equip Taliban, Mujahideen, jihadists against the Soviet Union, which had invaded Afghanistan. And with our help, and with the Pakistani support, this group, including at the time bin Laden, defeated the Soviet Union. So, 
Bin Laden was one of the good guys until all of a sudden he was not anymore. Um, that is exactly what has now happened with ISIS. That is exactly what has happened. And we know that because they make their own documents, like the CIA. A Pentagon report in 2012 says clearly that in the area we have these groups, the Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Al-Qaeda, the West and the Gulf countries and Turkey support this opposition. Meaning, we support Al-Qaeda. We give weapons and arms to Al-Qaeda. And to every single 20-man group we can find who are able to carry guns. We do that. Uh, and as the, the Guardian hasn't made any great articles about this, but they allowed this opinion um, where he says, a year into the Syrian re rebellion, the US and its allies weren't only supporting and arming an opposition that they knew to be dominated by extreme sectarian groups. They were prepared to countenance the creation of some sort of Islamic State. It is all in there. They counted on it. And the Islamic State, as we know, was uh, in 2014, it was officially declared. Um, so, what we do, we take a lot of arms, put them in the region, and then we leave them there. According to uh, International Business Times last year, ISIS had one billion worth of US Humvees. I don't know the price of the U.S. Humvee, Humvee but I would say that's a bloody lot of the hum, Humvees. Uh, and did they all just stand there with the keys in the ignition, or what are we supposed to think? What happened? Um, we don't know. But the size of this shows <coughs> when the U.S. goes to war, we really do something about it. We roll out the heavy stuff. Um, Already they <coughs> drive around the region with these uh, trucks, preferably Toyota, and it got totally absurd last year, maybe two years ago, uh, when this video uh, from ISIS uh, turned up on the net with this uh, uh, advertising on the, on the side from Mark I Plumbing. <laughs> and this Texas plumber actually sued his car dealer for not having removed is uh, advertising before selling it to the ISIS. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> quite an experience. American equipment driving around the desert, all good, we are there to promote freedom and democracy. American equipment taken over by the bad guys, now they drive around and cheer and smile. And uh, here we have Tank, happy guy standing there, I don't know where he learned to drive that thing. Um, but as he said, uh, the former uh, NATO General Secretary of Europe, he said in 2015, ISIS got started through funding from our friends and allies to fight to the death against Hezbollah. That was exactly what he said. And Hezbollah is another group of uh, Islamists who don't believe in this um, conservative version being practiced in Saudi Arabia. So they are the ones um, that they want to get rid of. He didn't say exactly who founded this thing, but he said it's like a Frankenstein. And then if you know the story about Frankenstein, you, you know that what we've been doing there is we have created a monster that is now turning against us in, from every angle, from every corner, and it's deliberate. That's the worst part of it. Or it looks like it's deliberate, let me rephrase that. Um, how did they get their money? Well, a 
according to this guy, uh, whom a colleague of mine talked to just last week, according to this guy who has written two books about it, um, and according to The Guardian from February 2007, between 12 and 14 billion dollars disappeared in Iraq. It was flown in on military planes for a period of months and it just disappeared. 12 to 14 billion dollars disappeared. Two billion dollars were later found in a bunker in Lebanon, but the rest is still gone. Uh, it was meant to, uh, to uh, reach the uh, Iraqi National Bank, but never did. Just disappeared. And as they say, how the US self sent 12 billion dollars in cash to Iraq and watched it vanish. That's exactly what they did. Um, so we don't have to look for final, finance sources for this terrorism. It was brought out in the area. So it's, it's safe to say that ISIS is a Western created entity. It's radicalized by us, it's trained by us, it's funded by us, and it's armed by us. Um, where the purpose of this terror group is this, I don't, uh, I don't know, this is not my graphic, but at least what it does is it helps the West destabilize terrorists where, which we can't conquer. Remember, remember this, take out seven countries in five years. We need to destabilize it. It gives us an enemy. It spreads fear in, in the West. And what does it do? It makes us demand more surveillance, more security, more uh, police, more military, more bombs, because we need to get rid of these bad guys. Um, it's getting totally ridiculous. And out in the open, as Chicago Tribune wrote there, uh, that's also three weeks ago, now CIA armed rebels are fighting against Pentagon armed rebels in Syria. The, they, don't, they don't control anything anymore. But what does that stop them from delivering tons and tons of new weapon? No, it doesn't, because it's part of the plan. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the problem. Obama, now he wants more guns, and either it goes to him or to him, we don't know, but it works. It's good for business. Um, as we can see, the arms sales in the world are dominated not by the, by the West, as uh, Forbes here writes, but by the US, definitely. Um, and look at the arms sales to this dictator state, to this crook state, Saudi Arabia, from the US, that's really skyrocketing. The US delivered 42% of the total arms supplied to the Middle East up to 2013. <coughs> it is a huge business. Last month, Saudi Arabia and South Africa uh, started a joint venture pro project in Saudi Arabia in order to make a bomb factory with help from uh, the German war industry. Um, what do they use all these bombs for? I mean, Saudi Arabia is in the middle of a desert, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, a couple of cities and a lot of oil fields. Why do they need bombs? They need them to bomb Yemen, for instance. And we have been bombing Yemen for one and a half year now. It looks like that when one of the bombs from Saudi Arabia has reached the target. Or it looks like that. Um, there you have one of the bad guys. Um, or it looks like that. That was a wedding party. But then it got hit by a bomb from Saudi Arabia. But they're only fighting Shiite rebels, they say. So it's okay. Only Shiite rebels. That's a hospital from uh, 
belonging to Doctors Without Borders, uh, January 10th this year, um, plus the 58 bombs dropped by the U.S. in Yemen on that year. Why are we actually bombing in Yemen? Does anyone know? I doubt it. That was March 26th. Millions of people on the streets in Yemen to protest against what they say is a U.S. backed Saudi-led attack against them as a people. But Saudi say, and we say, they are all Shiite rebels. They must be, otherwise we wouldn't bomb them, would we? Um, what happens every time, no matter what's the name of the bad guy, every time it's a war on infrastructure, every time. It's taken care of that it's going to take years and years, decades, before this region gets on its feet again. And you can see that, Iraq 2006, bridges, um, that's a um, power plant, and I mean, I, I don't have to come on it, it's devastation. That's how it looked in Koban, Syria. This town was occupied by the Islamic State, by the bad guys. So, of course, we take out the bad guys and we see here, we stand cheering in the foreground. It's all good. But that's the town right after. 45, 44 people, uh, 44,000 people lived there. Uh, no one knows uh, how many live there now, but uh, they are almost <coughs> all gone. They are now also refugees because they have nothing to come home to. So again, we make a massive destruction. Um, in Mosul, also last month, we killed 50, 25 people in the middle of the day when the US stroke the University of Mosul, claiming that it was the headquarter of the ISIS. So again, you destroy the university, it's going to take 20 years before we really get back to on the level again. And that's what is wanted. Doctors Without Borders in Afghanistan mm -hmm. lost 22 staff members, 37 wounded. Uh, the US is uh, making an airstrike claiming that Taliban was firing from inside the building. <coughs> Doctors Without Borders say that's insane, could never have happened, and that's that's the story, end of story. Somehow this logic seems to follow a path saying destroy, regime change, rebuild. And we happily move around in Afghanistan making new roads after we blown up the first ones. That's uh, and a Japanese entrepreneur who also is helping out. All this whole crap is ready to go even before the war started. And it's a little bit difficult to know who are actually the good guys, who are the bad guys. So I've made a little, uh, a, a little lecture for you here. Um, it can be difficult, so I, I've taken the liberty of putting in Super Mario uh, to, to make sure that we do understand that these guys are the good guys. Uh, these are Syrian rebels. They want to get rid of the bad guy who says that, so we support them. We also support, as I said, Saudi Arabia um, with huge violations of human rights, but no other, this is only Saudi rules. In the Ukraine, we support these guys because they are, as you can clearly see, Ukrainian freedom fighters. Where did they get their uniforms? Uh, but anyway, Super Mario is there. Um, we also support this guy. He was asked to, he was offered uh, the post as Speaker of the Parliament, but rejected because he found them probably too soft. So he's not 
uh, head of the parliament, he is. And he's head, he's founder of the National Party of Ukraine. Look at their uniforms, look at their attitude, and you are right, yes, they are <coughs> Nazis. Yes, they are. And they are proud of it. And we are supporting them. Because they don't like Putin. So, how come all these Nazi groups turn up in Ukraine? Well, the answer is simple. It is the CIA. In 1953, they started this process of destabilizing, destabilizing Ukraine. And they did so. Um, they would not only destabilize it, but also Nazify it. And they did so with followers of the World War II Ukrainian Nazi leader, Stefan Bandera. Um, and fact is, they have given weapon and they have trained and they have motivated a lot of extremist group, uh, groups also in Ukraine. And the result of it is that we have a country where 80 of these paramilitary groups are running around. All uniformed, all with uh, boots and everything you need. You don't see that in Denmark, so it has to come from somewhere. It do doesn't come out of the blue. It's an old process. It's from 1953. And um, that probably is the reason that Oliver Stone, he wrote in uh, two years ago, he said the Maiden uh, massacre was um, was uh, uh, well-armed neo-Nazi radicals who forced their way into this. And where did those neo-radicals uh, come from? Well, his next film is going to be titled The CIA and the Ukraine, or something like that. So I think that's the answer. Um, and this project was called Project Aerodynamic, and you can, yes, documents are released, yes, it's all there, I've read them, yes, they did make these Nazi connections and try to destabilize the country, that's what they wanted. Um, we also support Erdogan uh, right now, uh, although we know that he's making money on the oil business with ISIS, he's making money on trafficking, he's making money on a lot of crimes and is bombing uh, the Kurdish people almost every day with weapons that he gets from uh, the good guys in the West, meaning us. Um, this guy we hate, so it's not variable anymore. And uh, of course I could have found some violent pictures with uh, uh, people uh, that may have been killed by us. I don't know, that's not the point. The point is Look at his wife. That's the way women in Syria, in this liberal uh, Islamic part of the region, that's the way they get, go dressed. And that is what we don't like. The Saudis don't like this. They hate it. And ISIS, as we know, is a perverted version of the Saudi. They hate it even more. So that's why ISIS is our friend as long as they fight against Assad. It's a totally upside down. This guy we hate, and it's a real picture, it's, no, uh, it's really a real picture, it's an AFP picture. Um, because of this, because of, the, of, of this theater, for the last 18 <coughs> months, NATO, meaning the US, has been performing the largest military build-up in Europe since World War II. There has never, ever been so many troops, military equipment on European soil as right now. And as if that was not enough, Obama just <coughs> published that he is going to deploy an armored bri brigade now to Europe, which, which would triple this amount of military uh, presence in Europe. I know William Wimmer and I can tell you, he's a very nice man. He's a very polite man. But this whole scenery has made him say the U.S. is poisoning the climate in Europe. And um, meanwhile, in Israel, that's the good guys, those are real pictures.
that's the sunset over Gaza, and that's Gaza City, a little bit closer. Um, the Guardian reported it, and I mean, it, it, it doesn't need any, need any comments, actually. But this killing is what makes the business, makes the wheel go around. So, we all supported Saddam, and this picture is an official picture, uh, it's from the United States National Security Archive, so yes, they too, they did meet. It's Donald Rumsfeld and Saddam, and as I said, the U.S. financed with weapon and training and deliverance Saddam right up till he invaded uh, Kuwait. Um, John Pilger is one of the independent journalists of the world, and he recently said, had journalists and broadcasters <coughs> around the world John, done their job and questioned the propaganda that Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction, had the lies of George W. Bush and Tony Blair not been amplified and echoed by journalists, the invasion of Iraq might not have happened, and hundreds of thousands of people may still have been alive. It's only a matter of journalists not doing their job. And I could add to that, it goes for 9-11 too. Um, the invasion of Iraq, you can't see it any other way than it was the biggest terrorist attack in modern history. In the initial lithium attack, we killed 174,000 people. Boom. But they were all bad, or how was it? Um, Tony Blair was at British Prime. He was connected to the Carlyle Group. He is now CEO at Tony Blair Associates, doing lectures for kings and uh, dictators all over the world about the current uh, situation. And he's earning a lot of money. Again, Iraq, infrastructure definitely destroyed, millions homeless, country totally Iraq. And our own Rasmussen <coughs> said in 2008, NATO has been the most successful peace movement the world has ever known. Either this man is totally stupid or he is arrogant beyond any borders. It is, it is way out of line. I suggest go ask the people of Belgrade how they feel about NATO being a successful peace-creating army. We bombed, I'm sorry, we bombed the hell out of them for three months. We destroyed the city, we destroyed their infrastructure. We, hundreds and hundreds of bombs were thrown into the city, into the urban area where people live. And it, and it was all for peace. And also this one, we do know now, it was based on a lie. I'm sorry there was no genocide. I'm sorry there was, it was all a lie. And we know, because now we know, we didn't at the time, but now we know that the CIA was actively supporting the KLA, the Kosovo Liberation Army, and those guys being found in this van, which was one of the uh, main reasons that we actually uh, went there, they were wearing KLA outfit. And I don't have to go into it because my colleagues have already done so. <coughs> the Guardian wrote, CIA's bastard army ran riot in Balkans. They backed extremists. Uh, the Sunday Times, CIA aided Kosovo guerrilla army, or from the BBC News, this moral combat, NATO at war. It's all out in the open. It was a lie, and the CIA was heavily involved. Like always. There are independent journalists, and yes, I have allowed myself to be there too, but most important, 
is that you can find journalists still doing their work, only you won't find them in the mainstream media because they're blacked out. So what they're doing is exactly what I'm doing. Uh, they're making websites, they're making different publications, they're making books, they're making, giving lectures, uh, uh, making videos. In any way they can, they're trying to do their job. And thanks to the internet, I am now connected with all these guys directly, and all these guys contribute to this network that I'm building up. I'm, I'm grateful for all these guys because a lot of my knowledge comes through all these guys. Point is, we have got together, and that's a great feeling. Um, all these, every independent journalist in the world will say, investigate 9-11. You just have to look at it for a week as a professional. There is no other conclusion. Ever. And if they don't say it, they are not journalists. <coughs> On the other side, we have the mainstream media saying, Osama did it. But I can just give you two examples. Francisco Cusica said in an interview, uh, in this paper, Corriere de la Sera, uh, this disastrous attack, 9-11, has been planned and realized from the CIA and the Mossad with the aid of the Zionist world. That's his opinion. He is um, sort of heavily involved, <coughs> involved in politics. Andreas von Bülow, the former uh, German uh, Minister of Technology, with whom I've also personally spoken, says, Osama bin Laden is a product of the CIA, and he says about the attacks, mm. it's unthinkable without backing from the secret apparatuses of state and industry. I would say those two are sort of expert opinions, and they would know what they're talking about. It's also no, no uh, coincidence that he wrote his first book on the subject in 2002, titling the book The CIA and 9-11. So, Connections are there. Osama bin Laden, as I said, this is uh, by journalist Robert Fisk, The Independent, 1993. He was among the good guys for a lot of years. He was a businessman and he now, at that time, he had fought the Soviets. And now, as they say, he uses his soldiers for large scale, scale building projects. Clearly one of the good guys. There he is in um, Oxford. He was in Sweden, and it's probably, but I'm not sure, there's no guarantee, it's probably Bin Laden standing next to Brzezinski. Uh, at least, uh, it's not disputed that this was Brzezinski, he was in Pakistan at that time, and uh, at that time they did support uh, Osama Bin Laden. But they say that this can be any soldier, and it can, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, this Osama bin Laden was the man who then, all of a sudden, created this monstrosity of a, of a hollow mountain uh, for 500 or 1,000 people to survive in, and with modern uh, accommodations, all you need. Uh, and he was able to sit there with a satellite phone and control 19 hijackers with box cutters, uh, who then made three skyscrapers tumble with two airplanes. And um, you may buy that story, but it's totally out of the, out of the question. And if it wasn't so tragic, it, you could actually only laugh about it. But the problem is, this <coughs> tale has led us to an endless war with an enemy that we will never ever get rid of because we create him ourselves and it has changed our society with liberation values going totally out in the blue. We have, we have, we've lost it. We are just on the edge of losing it. So uh, regarding 9-11, I could uh, point to architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Um, 2,700 uh, members, I think, 
they all say investigate 9-11. And of course. So who is behind 9-11? Well, I'll give you my best shout. Some people say Israel is behind, some people say Rothschild is behind, some people say aliens are behind. I would look for the perpetrators within the intelligence communities. Because at a certain level, at a certain upper, upper operative level, these entities are not five, they are one. They act as one. They have one infrastructure, one line of command, one life. And it's concealed. It's got nothing to do with the, say, good-hearted CIA people doing their normal intelligence work, sitting uh, wherever they sit. It's got nothing to do with that. We're talking about deep state. And deep state is an instrument that occurs in every country where there's a war machine was a war producing industry because this mixture of politics and economics and war industry is taking out the democracy. Um, on my website, 321, that's the name of uh, our project, we have collected almost <coughs> everything one would need in order to know something about 9-11. Also the official report and we've also um, we've also gathered, uh, for instance, this report, the FEMA report, is available on the net uh, in, uh, I think, 57 bits and pieces, meaning there's no person on earth who will ever be able to read it in full. So we have put it together. You can download it uh, at our site. And you'll find all the pictures from all the four main events and spent one day, I, I, I don't doubt that you all here agree, agree but anyone who doubts uh, uh, the conspiracy theorist should just take a look there. Uh, otherwise, it's a, quite a normal website. Uh, this is the German version. What we do is we take articles from the internet and we put them on plain paper. Because when you put something on plain paper, um, as, a, as the very first thing, then you are able to make a physical magazine just by putting these bits and pieces together. So, creating, producing this magazine is a matter of minutes, and if you have su subscribers enough, you can make it run, and we do. So, what, what I have invented, so to speak, is the idea that you find good articles with sources and everything just like it should be done. Find what's on the net, put it on paper. Because <coughs> when it's on paper, it can no longer be censored, no longer be taken back. Uh, and if a website is blocked, it doesn't matter. The paper is out, it can be copied, it's preservable. And that's the whole point of power to the paper. Um, I started this uh, two years ago in Denmark, and last year I moved to Berlin. And this year we are active in Russia, in Ukraine, in hum Hungary, in Austria, uh, in Turkey, and in Germany. And coming up this year too will be a French version, a Spanish version, and a Portuguese version. And it's, it's because all over the world, people are now approaching us, saying, could you do something with our articles too? And yes, we can. Because that's the way, that's the way to reach. We put out 150,000 copies of this magazine in Germany that, last year. So <coughs> it really does have an impact. And I travel all over Germany, make lectures and speeches and all over there are small groups turning up every week, new groups, peace initiatives and everything, making, uh, um, how do you say in, in English, make, making advertising for us. So it, it's a remarkable period. Um, I would also like to recommend, and this is just a few, but 
That's some of the places where I get my uh, daily news feed. Um, and there are more, certainly there are more. But be aware, because as you just saw, uh, an, a nice layout doesn't necessarily mean that you have to believe what it says. A nice layout and a top professional approach could also mean that some uh, black-minded sponsors are behind it. Um, my good colleague, uh, I would almost say I admire him, but that's a, that's a great word. But he's doing his job. He's a journalist. He's just reporting, and that's it. And he said last week, a world war has begun. It's time to break the silence. And at least for the last bit, I, I totally agree. It is time to break the silence. And this silence should be broken by the established media, but they don't, they won't, and they never ever will. So who's to do it? Well, Noam Chomsky said, that right now the public opinion across the world is acting as a second superpower in the face of the United States. And that's exactly what's, what could happen if this second superpower would take over power. Um, I'll end this one with a quote from a very, very knowledgeable man. And it's really true. Don't believe everything you read on the net just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. So beware, take care, because it, it is a game. And you, you, as I said, you don't have to believe me either. That's not my mission. Actually, I, I couldn't care less. I feel confident that I have given you some information that may bring you to a second thought, the next time one of our politicians is talking about the necessity of going to war against this never-ending enemy, you, you may consider having something to say against it. Thanks a lot to my small but very steady network here in Denmark, and thanks to 9-11 through August for arranging this event. And I'm open for questions, and we'll do the question round in Danish then, yeah? Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>
at, at mennesker kan sidde og planlægge sådan noget, kan sidde og planlægge, så laver vi en, en terrorbegivenhed i en stor by, og der øh, dør så og så mange mennesker. Men det er, det er desværre, det er jo lige præcis den historiske virkelighed, vi er nødt til at se i øjnene. Det er, der er foregået så mange terrorangreb i Europa i Operation Gladio-tiden, at alene det burde være nok til, at der rejste sig en kæmpe skandale, som stillede spørgsmålstegn ved hele NATO's struktur, hele kommandolinjen i NATO. Øh, har vi styr på det? Er det en fredsbevægelse, som Fogh Rasmussen siger, eller, eller ikke? Du kan være helt sikker på, at, at alle danske myndigheder på alle planer øh, arbejder med i den her øh, Made in America øh, verdensbillede. Alle. Nu ved jeg ikke engang selv. <laughs> Og det er det, 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 det et godt eksempel. Jeg mener, hvis, når jeg i 2008 laver en bog, så fordi jeg mener, det er alvorligt. Når jeg så sender den til alle folketingsmedlemmer i privat adressen, som en julegave, så fordi jeg gerne vil fortælle noget. Og når så 179 folketingsmedlemmer reagerer med absolut stilhed, ikke en eneste kommentar i overvis aldrig nogensinde, så holder jeg som borger op med at tro på, at vi har et velfungerende demokrati. Og så kan jeg kigge på, fordi jeg nu ikke har haft andet at lave, og det er det, jeg siger, det må de nærmest selv om, så, så kan jeg kigge på, hvordan kan det så være? Og det er, fordi der er de her, de her kræfter, de her øh, bevægelser, som Eisenhower og Kennedy advarede imod, de er der. De er vandt. De er overlevet. Og siden Kennedy har ingen præsidenter udtalt sig kritisk imod det her. Det er også et faktum, at der er ingen, vi kender ikke, jeg kender ikke til Obama i øjeblikket, hvordan hans status er, men der er ingen andre præsidenter i USA's historie, par undtagelser, som ikke har været dybt involveret i alle mulige afarter af kriminalitet. Det er et faktum. Bush-familien, der, der ikke bare kan skrive tykke ud, der er skrevet stadigvis af bøger om de forbrydelser, som den familie har øh, været ansvarlig for. Startende med den gamle Prescott Bush, der understøttede Hitler, lavede forretninger med nazisterne under 2. verdenskrig, så langt frem, at hans øh, formue på et tidspunkt blev beslaglagt, fordi han netop lavede business with the enemy. Men det er det, er det her konglomerat, konglomerat af gamle, rige, onde mænd, der har siddet og bagt en rævekage på et eller andet tidspunkt. Fordi fristelsen, når man har et efterretningsapparat, der er uden for demokratisk kontrol, og budgetterne er hemmelige, fristelsen, at man skal bygge noget op, den er simpelthen for stor. Og det, der sker, det er, at det bliver en karriere i sig selv at være CIA-direktør. Altså, CIA er, har en politik, CIA er at betragte som en, et ekstra land, et land uden flag, men et land, der opererer over hele verden, det har vi set, som, som hjemmevandt går på, går på alle nationers grund og foretager kidnapninger og mor og terror. Og alligevel er der ikke en eneste i den etablerede presse, der gør andet end bare en gang imellem at skrive Altså en gang imellem kommer der de her artikler, I, I har set, at jeg har fundet nogle af dem. Men det der er problemet, det er, at de her seniorredaktører, der sidder i Atlantic Brygge, og som sidder op, højt op i hierarkiet, dem der bestemmer, hvilke ting skal vi køre kampagner på, det er dem, der bestemmer, hvad der kommer ud. Når vi lige har set nu ni eksempler fra, fra de her Panama-papirer, så viser det, at det er lige præcis det, man gør, det er, at man har et væld af muligheder nu. Man kunne have man kunne have tjekket for øh, amerikanske millionærer eller øh, Hollywood, øh, hvor mange Hollywood-stjerner øh, er med. Altså, der er masser af veje, man kunne gå, når man har øh, 11,5 millioner dokumenter. Men man har valgt ni personer ud, og, og så har det en klar, klar politisk undertone, fordi det er alle sammen nogen, der er anti-USA. Det er, altså, det er simpelthen for tykt. Ja. De her mennesker, de, altså dem, 
på magten, de er, øh, de er virkelig psykopater. Ja, det er noget, jeg har undersøgt meget, at de faktisk mange af dem, de er satanister, og de laver ritualer, og myrder børn, og de her false flags, og krige faktisk, det er faktisk sacrifices. Og de, de bliver udøvet på datoer, som er hellige i den sataniske kalender. Ja, øh, ja. Øh, alt sammen, hvad du lige sagde, vil jeg ikke sige, er forkert. Nej. Fordi det er også et historisk faktum, at i blandt de her mennesker, der har du ret, og det kan man også sige åbent. Øh, jeg ved ikke, hvor mange af jer kender til Bohemian Grove, med Bohemian Club, og det er jo, det er jo <laughs> totalt oplysning der. Men, men når vi har en verden, hvor vores politiske øverste elite mødes en gang om året og bruger, så vidt jeg ved, to uger af deres værdifulde tid på at rende rundt i et naturområde, hvor alting er lukket inde, og hvor processen ender med en stor ceremoni, hvor man står og tilbeder en statue af Molok, som er en djævlefigur, og i processen symbolsk offrer et barne, en barnekrop til Molok. Så er der i mine ører et eller andet, der skuer. Der, der, der er noget i det billede, jeg, jeg ikke bryder mig om. Det, der, altså, det er ikke dem, det er ikke, det er ikke dem, der går ud. Det er ikke dem, vi, der ligesom er i første række, i, der, der styrer det her spil. Og det er, jo ikke, det er jo ikke så simpelt, at man kan sige, at fordi øh, nogen sidder i eliten og er satanister, så øh, vælter djævelens ondskab ud over os. Men der er nogen ja. i blandt dem, der virkelig tænker de tanker. Men hvis vi kigger på, hvilke datoer får du slags... Uh, ja, det, set, det, så er det faktisk en heldig dag for satan. Det er sandt, det er sandt. Altså, det er, det er. altså hele den der side af historien, havde jeg egentlig tænkt mig at kigge nærmere på, sådan på min gamle dage, når, når, når ligesom alle de her faktiske, praktiske ting, de var af vejen. På plads, ja. ja. Øhm, fordi det, det er, det, altså et eller andet sted, øh, hvis man ser, altså man kan sige det sådan, hvis jeg havde en fabrik, der lavede bomber, og jeg kunne sælge bomber til Saudi-Arabien, så kunne jeg selvfølgelig blive en rigtig glad kapitalist, fordi jeg kunne sælge rigtig mange, mange bomber. Og øh, det i sig selv, det er selvfølgelig, man kan sige, det er, det er ondt, og det er hensynsløst, øh, men det er ikke, det er ikke ligefrem djævelskab som sådan. Men hvis du ser på, at man i løbet af et år smider 23.000 bomber, som USA gjorde, i en bestemt region, bredt ud, og så tænker på al den død og ødelæggelse og lidelse, der kommer ud af det, så nærmer det sig djævelske dimensioner, vil jeg sige. Ja. Jeg kan du fortælle noget om Ritzau fra Reuters, hvordan de fungerer? Ja. Øh... Det er altid det, de henviser til Ritzau eller Reuters, eller som jeg så på et tid, så de mængde til en stat brugte som kilder og ja. Altså, både Ritzau og Reuters, det, det er de, de største, skal vi sige, reklameafdelinger for den til enhver tid herskende officielle forklaring på hvad som helst. Og det er, det er uinteressant, hvem der ejer Reuters. Det er også uinteressant, hvem der ejer vores nationalbank. Det, der er interessant, det er, hvad de bliver brugt til. Og Reuters bliver brugt til krigspropaganda. Det skal forstås sådan, at det er Reuters, der sender øh, pressemeddelelser ud til hele deres netværk, at øh, nu har vi ramt en, en, en terrorist et eller andet sted. Det er Reuters, der vinkler historien. Jeg oplevede øh, i 2008 i forbindelse med min bog, at Danmarks Radio journalister anede ikke, jeg, jeg vidste dem, jeg sendte en masse billeder over til dem, de havde ikke set nogen af dem før, aldrig. Og det gik op for mig, at grunden til, at de ikke havde set dem, det var, at de havde slet ikke adgang til dem i deres billedarkivsystem. Det var nemlig styret af Reuters og så Ritzau. Og der var en bestemt billedpool til rådighed under emnet 9-11. Og der var x antal billeder. Og det var den verdensforståelse, journalisterne i Danmarks Radio havde af 9-11.
Så når jeg pludselig sender dem nogle billeder, ja. hvor man kan se, at der er ikke nogen dragdel på, på øh, planen foran, eller whatever, for der er masser af mistænkelige billeder, og de får et, et mindre chok, så viser det netop, hvordan, hvor, hvor hæftigt de har styret informationsstrømmen. Og, det, og det, det, det er det, de gør. Det lyder, det lyder rigtig, rigtig godt med sådan et Ritzhavsbyrå, Reutersbyrå. Øh, altså, jeg er selv vokset op med en fuldstændig blind tro på det her system. Ja. Hvad mener du er chancen for at opklare 9-11, altså med personer og hvordan og hvad ledes med planlægning og så videre? 9-11 er opklaret. Den, det, det, det er bare ikke ligesom øh, udelukket. <laughs> Tommy? Jeg synes, det er rigtig flot foredrag. Tusind tak for din gang. Tak for det. Tak for det. Tak for det. Det er selvfølgelig lidt. Det er selvfølgelig lidt, når man også er langt. Øh, men, men hvis du tager det samlede, det samlede materiale, der i dag foreligger, øh, hvor forfattere og researchere har lavet det arbejde, som øh, 9-11-kommissionen aldrig nogensinde lavede, og som det heller ikke var meningen, skulle lave, så vil man vide, i hvilken personkreds man skal kigge efter de, skal vi sige, primære gerne, gerne Det er klart. Og så, øh, når de her 28 sider bliver frigjort, øh, så man kan tydeligt se, at det, også det kommer fra Saudi-Arabien. I forvejen var 15 af de 19 flykabere Saudi-Arabiske statsborgere. Deres viser blev udstedt på det amerikanske konsulat i Jeddah, som under Mujahedin sagen blev brugt mm. til at transportere alle de her Mujahedin kriger frem og tilbage, så det her konsulat var kendt i branchen som CIA's visafabrik. Det var dem, der udstedte. Så <coughs> altså, vi, er, vi, er, vi er meget, meget tæt på. Altså, 9-11 ville være opklaret, hvis 9-11-kommissionen havde gjort deres arbejde. 9-11 ville være opklaret nu, hvis journalister øh, på de store medier havde gjort deres arbejde. Fordi det er åbenlyst, hvor man skal kigge efter gerningsmændene. Og så kan man bagefter begynde at kigge på, hvem står så bag ved bagved, og så kommer efterretnings uh, intelligence service osv. Det er et kæmpe stort netværk. Det, der er ikke én, der er ikke én eller fem eller ti. Det er interessegrupper, der alle sammen arbejder i den samme retning, og hvor terrorbegivenheder er en nødvendig led for at skabe mobilisering i befolkningen for at skabe opbakning i befolkningen. Ja. Ja. Jamen, det er jo bare et forlængelse med Henrik uh, Fritters Bureau. Altså, jeg anser Fritters Bureau for at være suverænt det største uh, journalistiske problem i, uh, i Danmark. Fordi den måde, uh, ja. jeg spørger en del år siden, dengang jeg gad at læse ud, så så jeg det der alt, hvad der kom på Fritters Bureau, det var bare for at følge med i, uh, og mig, der ledte op til ordentlig journalistisk standard. Og, uh, det var der stort set ikke noget, det var cirka en om ugen, og så kan man måske at sige, 60 telegrammer om, øh, om, om dagen, og en gang om ugen, typisk sådan noget lørdag nat eller sådan et eller andet. Så kom der et eller andet, hvor man kunne sige, at det var gennembearbejdet, det var øh, reddeligt, der var nogle biler på, og sådan et eller andet. Det har sikkert været en eller anden studerende, der har fået sådan en eller anden natitjens der lørdag, og redaktøren har ikke været der. Og, 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 og så var det ligesom, det var, det var sådan typisk en gang om ugen, at der var noget alt andet. Ja, man er på det her, og så drejer det på den ene, og den ene, og så går det frisk igen. Altså hele systemet, hele ideen med systemet er jo genial, at vi har, vi har en gruppe journalister, der sørger for, at politikere og andre magthavere, de holder sig inden for ret og rimelighed, og så baseret på det, så kan folk så stemme ved valgene, og så får vi de politikere, vi har fortjent. Det er jo et perfekt system. Problemet er bare, at når den her knastaksel, der hedder den frie presse, når den ikke fungerer, men derimod bliver en del af magtsystemet, så kører det fuldstændig skævt. Og, og det, vi er kørt i den grad skævt i den vestlige verden. Det er først på nylig gået op for mig, men det er så massivt propaganda, det der bliver sendt ud. Og propagandaen har til formål at finde the bad guy. <tryk> 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 Det er et falsk billede af, hvad situationen er. Det er. Ja, ja. Og, og, det, og igen, det er der intet nyt i, og det er vigtigt at sige, det gør både CIA og KGB. Problemet er bare, at i vores tid, vi lever i en tid, hvor det ene imperium tydeligvis er ved at vinde over det andet. 
Og det er ubehageligt. Altså, alt andet lige var verdensfreden måske bedre tjent med, at der var en vis ligevægt, fordi det, der sker i øjeblikket, det er, at alle lande bliver amerikaniseret, og med amerikanisering har vi set, der følger i hvert fald i nogle tilfælde en nazificering, en højredrejning. Og det betyder, at vi lige pludselig kommer til at leve i et samfund med helt andre værdier, end dem, vi er vokset op med. Og vi aner slet ikke, hvor det er kommet fra, for det kommer som en tyv om natten. Men der er grund til håb under alle omstændigheder, fordi jeg møder, jeg møder, jeg har mødt i Tyskland nu i de sidste to år, tusinder af mennesker, det er ikke overdrevet, som, som alle sammen stort set, jeg vil nærmest sige, ved alt, hvad jeg har sagt her i aften, måske ikke i alle detaljer, men de kender den her manipulation. Tyskerne lader sig ikke på nær samme måde bare fortælle noget. Vi skal tænke på, at vi i Danmark har haft den unikke situation, at vi i mange, mange år kun havde én tv kan Jeg kan selv huske det, hvordan det var. Og nyhederne kommer ud af den kasse. Det er der. Det er der, vi sidder og kigger på vores korrespondenter i Washington, da Danmarks Radio havde fik korrespondenter i Washington. Og så står de der med en forblæst mikrofon og fortæller os om en afstemning i den amerikanske kongres. Vi har fået uden og vide og vilde det amerikanske verdensbillede oversat til dansk, fuldstændig ind med modermælken, fordi det var de der troværdige mennesker i fjernsynet, der stod og fortalte os det. Det nummer kan man ikke lave med ret mange andre nationer, man kan gøre det med Danmark, fordi vi er et lille bitte sprogområde, og vi har ikke, der, er ikke nogen, der er ikke andre, der forstår vores sprog end os. Tyskerne er omgivet af alle andre sprog på alle andre sider, det gælder stort set alle andre lande, det vil sige, du kan ikke på en gang bilde hele den franske befolkning én ting ind. Det kan du til en vis udstrækning med den danske. Det kunne du i hvert fald, da vi havde en tv kanal. Og internettet er så selvfølgelig det, der, der løber dørene op, det er det, jeg siger, der, der er håb. Fordi der er så meget viden rundt omkring, og der er ikke, heller ikke danskere vil have den her krig. Der er, jo, der er jo ingen fornuftige mennesker, der vil den udvikling, som vi er i gang med. Og tænk hvad hvad mennesket overhovedet tænkte, hvad vi kunne udrette, hvis ikke det var fordi øh, hovedparten af vores aktiviteter blev brugt til krig, til at dræbe andre mennesker med. Jeg er fuldstændig stået af den, øh, af den øh, logik, der er, det er absolut på tid at sige stop. Og det er den her of, of, den offentlige mening. Den offentlige mening, det er jer. Det er jer, der går hjem og taler med jeres nabo og jeres bekendt og jeres familie, og, og, og taler om det her, og siger, at nu, nu, nu må det være nok. Nu, nu kan, verden kan ikke sådan længere. Vi vil det ikke længere. Om der så bliver nogen tilbage til at stemme på, det ved jeg ikke, men det bliver så, det bliver så et andet problem, vi har her i Danmark. Jeg skal lige sige, at vi skal, vi skal okay. være ude her ellers, så lige en fem minutter mere. Altså. Vi gør bare alle sammen, hvad lyder sig, gør det også. Nå, det synes jeg ikke. <laughs> ja. Der er jo kastet af to grupper også. Ja. Og det hører vi jo ikke fra mig om. Nej. Øh, du ja. ved godt, i Veteran Today, der for knap et år siden, der kastede de det i Yemen. Øh, hvad hedder det? Saudi-arabiske fly, som var udstyret med israelske ja. bomber. Det var ikke så fly, som så fløj med alle dem. Ja, ja, ja. Og de er analyseret, fordi skal man se til bund til det her, så er man nødt til at bruge blandt andet noget naturvidenskab, selvom det står rigtig til med det. Så, så er man nødt til at kunne se, at det er jo det, Niels Harald har gjort ved hjælp af 11 og så vist, at det strider mod naturloven. Ja, ja. Og det kan man også gøre med det der, altså for eksempel et, et lille øh, kamera, med plastiklinser, de danner nogle ganske bestemte billeder, som er en god indikator for, at der er kastet en personbombe. Det er sandt, og, 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 og det er der desværre rigtig, rigtig mange steder, og det er os, der gør det. Det er os, the good guys. Vi bruger beriget uranium af ammunition. 10.000 af irakiske børn er født med deformiteter nu, i de her år, fordi vi har skudt med beriget uranium. Vi gør det samme i Syrien i øjeblikket. Vi begår de mest bestialske krigsforbrydelser. Beriget uranium, det betyder, at det vil ligge i området og være radioaktivt i 150.000 år eller mere. 
Is it worth the price? Eller, eller har vi noget punkt nu, hvor nu må det simpelthen være nok? Ja. Når det så er nok, når det så er, at øh, her på Danmark har fået nok, hvad så? Hvordan får vi dem så ud på gaden? Det er et stort, stort problem. Nej, fordi jeg har faktisk brug for nogle hacker, der lige kan sørge for strømmen i et vist tidsrum på en eller anden given dato, som vi bliver enige om. Godt. Så skal de bare se. Den er med på, den er med på, fordi det er, det er, det er formentlig et problem. Altså, man siger i Tyskland, at der bliver ikke nogen revolution i Tyskland, fordi der findes ikke nogen formular til det. <laughs> og det er lidt, lidt det samme, der bliver en revolution herhjemme, fordi vi skal, vi skal også lige nå til at vise. Uh, altså det, det, men, men heldigvis, det, det ændrer sig drastisk. Altså jeg, får, jeg bliver ringet op, og jeg får e-mails fra alle, altså alle ender i samfundet. Mennesker, der, der bare siger, bliv ved, hvor er det godt, lad os få det her. Altså systemet med det her magasin er jo det, skal jeg lige sige kort, at man kan ikke abonnere på det som et almindeligt enkelt magasin. Man får sådan en pakke med 10. Og det er fordi, vi vil provokere aktivisme, og det er det, der er sket. Det er netop, at når fru Jensen modtager 10, så læser hun det, og så bliver hun begejstret. Og så har hun ni andre, som hun kan dele ud af. Og det, det er der ingen, der, der gør, men det virker. Det virker i... Altså det her magasin, øh, det ligger på caféer og øh, biblioteker og i S-baner og i skoler og alle mulige steder i, i Berlin. Jeg bliver stanset på gaden mindst en gang om ugen af folk, jeg ikke kender, så gang midt i en fodgængerovergang, fordi de vil trykke min hånd, fordi hvor er det godt. Øh, så altså, jeg har det godt, hvad det her angår. Det er bare pokkers, at, at de her emner virkelig skal være så for verden alvorlig. Det er, hvis ikke, hvis ikke vi får ændret den her udvikling nu om fem år, så er det slut, så har, så har vi ikke noget frit internet, kan jeg fortælle jer. Så har vi en politistat, og den bliver styret globalt af én organisation. Sandsynligvis vores egen gode uh, FN, uh, som bliver det nye verdenspoliti. Uh, er, I, er I klar over, at man i Danmark uh, nu er begyndt at tale om, at vi skal udfase politiet, og så skal vi indfase militæret. Det foregår over hele Europa. Det er ikke nogen isoleret tilfældig dansk øh, udvikling. Det er en styret planer udvikling, der godt kunne sætte det hen imod nogle meget ubehagelige perspektiver. Så er vi nødt til at starte mod statsbevægelsen. Ja. Det er far, han må selv med til at lede nogle grupper, det ikke Vi skal have lagt det magasin ud på samtlige grupper. Det er, det er, jamen altså, ja. Nu er det selvfølgelig mit barn, det her, men, men der er kun den her ene vej til at forændre det her system. Vi kan lave nok så mange hjemmesider. Det, det er fuldstændig ligegyldigt. Det flytter det ikke noget. Det her flytter noget, fordi det her, det kan du tage, du er nødt til at tage det alvorligt. Når vi har skrevet om Tysklands skyggeregering her i, så er det Atlantik Brygge systemet, vi har skrevet om her i så er man nødt til at tage det alvorligt, for her står det skrevet, hvem har sagt hvad, hvornår. Du kan ikke, du kan ikke, du kan, den form for opmærksomhed får du aldrig på en iPad eller en uh, uh, iPhone. Ja. Jeg kan bare sige til, til håbet, for at få det lidt til at vokse, så er der så også mange tv-folk og ja. journalister, som er ved at vågne op. Ja. Øh, de går stille med dørene, men der er folk, der rigtig gerne vil lave noget om det her. Ja. Så der foregår ting, fordi vi skal lige sige. Jamen det, det er sandt. Så, så, så der kommer snart nogle ting. Det er, det er, det er rigtigt, der ligger, og det er godt at høre dig sige. Nej, hvor vi glæder os. Det er godt. Ja, ja sidste spørgsmål. Jeg tænker bare, at vi ikke afsætter, at vi laver en demonstration på sættet. Det er med strømmen. Ja, ens. Så bare lad os slukke strømmen. Lad os slukke for strømmen. Ja, og så tager vi ud på gaden. Er der ikke et sted, vi skal møde? 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 Er der ikke et sted, vi skal møde?